the U.S. Congress got underway, George Washington would be chosen as the first president unanimously by the Electoral College. As he settled into a presidency that he really didn't want but felt he had to do for his country, he recognized that he was setting precedent for others to follow and that the Constitution only provided a framework for the new government. There would be a tremendous amount of leeway in creating the actual functioning government. Washington at Congress established the various executive departments, in effect creating a cabinet made up of the heads of those departments to serve as potential advisors to him. To lead the Department of State, Washington chose Thomas Jefferson. To lead the Department of the Treasury, he chose his former military aide, Alexander Hamilton. To lead the Department of War, he chose Henry Knox, a general who had also served alongside him in the Revolution. And to lead the office of the Attorney General, he chose Edmund Randolph. Today, the order in which the departments are chosen affects the line of succession, as following the Vice President, the Speaker of the House, and the President Pro Temp of the Senate today, the Cabinet officers are in the succession in the order that their department was created. Cabinet officers still, however, must meet the requirements for being President in order to be in that succession, otherwise they are skipped. Regardless, though, to this day, the succession has never gone beyond Vice President. Congress also passed the Judiciary Act of 1789, which established the federal court system and defined the makeup of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court had already been established by Article III of the Constitution, but the lower courts were to be created at the discretion of Congress. The Supreme Court was set at six members initially, with one Chief Justice and five Associate Justices, and the rest of the court system Congress created, and it would have several levels. The lowest level would be district court, and the entire United States would be divided into district, initially 13, today there's 94. And circuit courts of appeals, they would have appellate jurisdiction over the district courts. What that means is that a decision reached by the district court could be appealed to the circuit court in hopes that the lower court's decision would be overturned. The Supreme Court would have appellate jurisdiction over the circuit courts, as well as the state courts, as it was stated in the Constitution, essentially making the Supreme Court the Court of Final Appeals. Although Washington was in charge, like the military command he had once been, he delegated some of the important structuring of the government to his cabinet officers. Putting the nation's finances on a firm footing was of utmost importance, and the plan to do so was developed by Alexander Hamilton as Secretary of the Treasury. How to help the issue with the debt required the nation to pay its debt in full and at face value in order to gain credibility with foreign powers. Hamilton wanted all of the debt of the nation, including that of the states, to be consolidated and paid at face value and not charged off. The issue caused quite a bit of debate. And in the end, the deadlock was broken with a deal that would locate a permanent capital for the United States in the South, which had been largely against the assumption of state debt. This new capital would be away from the existing major cities and their supposed influence. Initially, the capital would be moved to Philadelphia from New York and then on to a new federal city that would not be part of any state that was planned to be built along the banks of the Potomac River that separated Maryland from Virginia. Hamilton's financial program, now deeply in debt, called for the enactment of tariffs, which were allowed, although Congress set the tariff rate lower than what Hamilton felt was needed, and so he included what were called excise taxes, which were taxes on certain goods produced in the United States, including sugar, salt, and alcohol. It did not matter where these goods were to be sold, at home or abroad, the producers of these goods would pay the excise taxes, and they would simply pass along the cost to the consumer. The tax on alcohol generated the most outrage, especially by those on the frontier, since whiskey was their most profitable product. It was far easier in the West to convert grains and fruit crops to alcohol than to transport the bulky original crops to market. Hamilton also called for the establishment of a national bank that would hold government money and pay its bills. This bank would also loan money to the government as well as to other banks and to regulate the currency and include it would be 
authorized the printing and the coining of a national currency. James Madison and Thomas Jefferson objected to the creation of a bank, arguing that the authority to do so was not in the Constitution and went against some of the great financial treaties of um, writings such as those by Adam Smith. But Hamilton argued that the creation of a bank was implied by the specific powers that were explicitly granted to Congress in Article I. And because Congress had the ability to pass laws that would carry out their powers, laws that were necessary, according to Article I, Section 8, Clause 18, that the creation of a bank was a necessity. Congress agreed with Hamilton, and the bank was approved. Hamilton also hoped to have the federal government encourage manufacturing by having the government invested in manufacturing interests, as well as creating a national transportation network. But few of those proposals were enacted as related to manufacturing because of opposition from the South. His ideas, however, would influence future Congresses for decades to come. As president, Washington would also have to respond to various international crises. With the outbreak of the French Revolution in 1789, and it's turning extremely radical by the start of Washington's second term. This is when the king and queen of France, as well as more than 100 aristocrats, were executed. That French Revolution then expanded into war in the rest of Europe, with Britain and France once again becoming rivals. Washington wanted to keep the United States out of this war in Europe and declared neutrality in 1793. Thomas Jefferson, who felt that the future of the United States Republic would be threatened unless they agreed to assist the people of France. Hamilton joined Washington in opposition of Jefferson's position, setting up a permanent feud between the two men and eventually to Jefferson's resignation as Secretary of State. The American people themselves began to take sides. With the growing Republican Party, sometimes called the Democratic Republicans or even the Jeffersonian Democrats, supporting the French people, and the Federalist Party siding with the British in this war against France. As the war progressed, Britain's warships began violating international agreements by seizing American ships delivering goods to French ports. Remember, America was officially neutral. The crews of these ships were also often pressed into the service of the British Navy, meaning they would be forced to serve in the British Navy. At the same time, British troops on the frontier were believed to be arming Native Americans, who were then attacking settlers expanding westward. In 1794, Washington sent Chief Justice John Jay to London to try and settle the disputes between the two nations, sending Jay because Thomas Jefferson had resigned. In exchange for a promise by the Americans to not ship goods that could potentially build French warships, as well as to pay the debts that were still owed to British merchants and loyalists, the British agreed to evacuate the forts on the western frontier to compensate for previous losses of ships seized by the British Navy and to open trade for American shipping into the West Indies. There was no promise, however, of seizing future ships or crews, and it clearly favored trade with Britain over trade with France, and it made no mention of pressing Americans into the service of the British Navy. There was incredible opposition to Jay's treaty, especially in the South among members of the Democratic Republican Party, but it still had enough votes to pass the Senate. Possibly concerned about the lack of a British presence on the frontier, the Spanish began negotiating with the Americans over Louisiana and Florida. The resulting treaty, negotiated by Thomas Pinckney, and therefore called the Pinckney Treaty, settled on a border of Florida along the 31st parallel and promised to open the Mississippi River to American trade once again. Since not all American goods would actually be sold in New Orleans, but would instead be shipped on to other ports, it was important for this treaty to include the granting to the United States of what was called the right of deposit, which was the right to transfer goods from river-going ships to ocean-going ships without the payment of an import tax in New Orleans. Domestic issues continued, 
and there were increasing fears that the Native Americans were resisting westward expansion, and a war between settlers and more than 2,600 troops, led by revolutionary war hero General Anthony Wayne, began in uh, the Northwest Territory, um, the war being fought against some 2,000 Shawnee, Ottawa, Chippewa, Delaware, and Potawatomi warriors in the vicinity of Fort Grenville in Ohio, up near the Michigan border. In the Battle of Fallen Timbers near present-day Toledo, the American forces defeated the Native Americans and forced through the Treaty of Grenville that would move the natives further west and open up their former territory for white settlement. Soon after, the tensions on the frontier exploded into resistance to government policies, especially the payment of the taxes on whiskey. Inspired by the French Revolution, farmers marched on tax collectors, threatening to tar and feather them in order to prevent the collecting of the tax. Washington ordered the revolt to end, and when it didn't, he personally led more than 15,000 militia, who had been temporarily made federal troops, since there was virtually no army, and he led them into the Pennsylvania wilderness, which caused the rebels to simply vanish. But the show of force deepened the divisions about the power of the national government and would be a cause for the increasing strength of the growing Democratic Republican Party and a division in the United States along party lines. After two terms in office, Washington declined to run again, wanting to retire to his estate to live out the remainder of his life, which as it turns out was just three years away. As a farewell for the nation, he prepared an address that would be published in the nation's newspapers. In it, he offered some advice for the growing nation, approving of commercial relationships with other countries, but recommending against political alliances. He deplored sectionalism and partisan strife, which was interpreted to mean that he hated political parties and hoped that they wouldn't develop here in the U.S., although it was too late for that. For roughly 150 years, Washington's advice was largely followed, especially as it applied to international policies. But as the world reeled from two world wars in a span of about 25 years, the role that the United States would adopt in world politics would be much more focused on maintaining an international involvement.